Hello guys and welcome to this week's Penny Podcast. I'm Andres Bear, I'm in 11th grade, and I am the Capo Student Media Web Producer. I'm Sarah Wu in 11th grade and I'm a staff writer on the sidekick. The Penny Podcast is a weekly hybrid podcast that incorporates elements of interview and conversation with rotating hosts. This week's Coppell student media highlight comes from Anika Arutla for her article headline, Enhancing Self-Confidence in One Go, Verma Clem Create Encore Talent Group for Performing Opportunities Published Under Our Student Life Section. The story details the creation of the Encore Talent Group and the opportunities it can provide to their performers. A quote I found interesting from the article was when Anika mentioned that senior homes and hospitals are the perfect places to perform because they allow a minor to perform while other locations are exclusive to older performers. See, I love what they're doing because they're giving young performers opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very necessary in the artistic world. And keeping with the theme of art, last Thursday, the much anticipated follow-up to Avengers Infinity War released. Avengers Endgame, the 22nd film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is now the 13th highest grossing film of all time. It's likely that the film could place higher as the weeks go on. Do yourself a favor and watch the conclusion to the current MCU storyline. On a less galaxy-spanning note, we'd like to welcome back a familiar guest. Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Christine Zitzwe and I am a senior and the executive news editor of The Sidekick. Describe Chin culture to me, the language, the clothes that make it up. So it's pretty difficult to just narrow it down to one single answer, but um, if you look at the country as a whole, Myanmar, um, where I come from, or it was formerly um, called Burma, but now it is called Myanmar, um, it's made up of many different states, uh, much like the United States, we have like Kansas, Texas, Florida. So it's, you know, in a sense, it is similar to that, it's broken up of different states, but these states are not like America where we all basically speak English unofficially, it's the uh, language that we speak, mm -hmm. but there it's like every single um, state has its own different culture, has its own different um, set of social uh, like rules, um, its own like belief systems, like you have like ranging, the country's primarily Buddhist, but um, where I come from, my village is called Hakka, and it's um, in the um, located northeast in the Chin state. So in that, the culture is, um, I would have to say, it's very individualized to that state, I would say. Um, it's very difficult to explain the culture when you haven't seen the clothing, but um, I can show you pictures of the clothing if y'all would like. Awesome, yes, we would. Okay, so, so just from a basic Google search, um, you have the, uh, this is the typical, uh, the um, Chin traditional outfit. Um, most of the time, it, the male outfit is very, it varies a lot, but this is what typically what the female outfit looks like. You have the uh, top, you have the knee, or what's called, it's like the, uh, the skirt. And um, it's made up of like a handmade fabric and they mm -hmm. like kind of uh, weave it on this like um, contraption. But um, now it is, I'm not too completely sure on how they make it, but most of the uh, fabric is handmade. And um, the colors range from yellow to red um, to black, blue, all of that. But the traditional color is um, red. And um, you have a lot of different like jewelry that like goes with the outfit, and you see here it can get really heavy. Right. Yeah, there's like different beadings, accessories, um, detailing that like goes down all the way to the bottom of the um, to the skirt, and you have like metal jewelry. You have a necklace, and um, I actually have some in that bag if you want to see for later. But Ooh, um, definitely, that's the. Um, oh wow. That's Yes. So make sure to tune in to your screen right now so you can see what we're messing around with. <laughs> yes. Wow. So what type of occasions would you typically wear these clothing? Um, so this type of clothing, um, it is traditional wear. M nowadays, you don't, if you do live in America, you will see um, every Sunday. It is, the Chin culture is very based around the church. So every Sunday, a lot of the girls um, wear a a version of this outfit, I would say, but it ranges from 
Hakka Chin clothing to Burmese clothing, and that's another set of clothing, which is more um, of the, of the uh, I would say, customary wear. And it, it, it looks very different. It's, not, it's made of a different fabric. It doesn't have this type of pattern. It doesn't have the de- same detailing. But you would wear it, specifically this outfit you would wear to like um, a national like celebration or like a festival regarding this culture, actually. Or um, you could wear it at weddings also if you're very, you know, I would say old fashioned. Because mm-hmm. a lot of weddings now are Americanized are more and more drifting away from this cultural wear. Yeah. And they wear more of the Americanized wedding dresses and, you know, all that stuff. And how do you feel about the Americanization of not only Chin culture, but just different cultures in general as they're all just coming together in this potluck of culture in America? Do you see it in your culture and wherever else you go? Um, For sure. Um, I think to answer that question, I am definitely a byproduct of that and to just shortly answer that um i would i basically immigrated from um haka um when i was two so uh i basically was raised in the united states but i came from burma so i literally know or i basically know little to nothing about my culture um i it, it was hard growing up for me to connect with the people around me because i felt a little bit you know weird about how i pronounce how do i um, say these words. If you were to ask another person at my church who is more well acquainted with the culture, then they would for sure in a heartbeat tell you what this is, what this item of clothing is, um, what this food is called. But that's as I'm doing the best of my abilities and I hope that with the story I'm doing and just me coming here, I can kind of um, be a little bit more self-aware in my culture and not be so, um, sh- not shy away from it so much is what I'm trying to do. Was there ever a point where you had to accept your culture in order to fully embrace yourself? Um, I think it's not a question that I thought so deeply about, but go, growing up in America and then still having that um, that cultural part, like every Sunday I go to church or Saturday even now, I go to choir practice for church. It just It all revolves around that. So growing up, I did have that experience in my life, but I never was like, oh, I I fully reject it or I I hate this cult, kind of culture. But um, I did have little moments when I was growing up where I was like, this would be so weird to like my school friends. Yeah. Like even now, y'all are just so puzzled by everything. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's actually, and to me, it's so weird because this is my like life, you know? So yeah. it's like, it's crazy how... Y'all are asking all these questions, but to me, it's just what I see every weekend. So um, to answer that, I there was moments um, at school. You have different um, different people, mostly Americanized, you know, although they can come from another like race, like they're Hispanic or, you know, I don't know, Irish or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, they do have their own culture, but I just feel like mine specifically is just so tailored to where I've come from that it's just it's so hard not to share and I think you know my senior year of high school I kind of realized that right and it's something that's special to you clearly because yes we see all these different cultures and their clothing but we don't realize that there's little subsects there's little parts of these cultures that can become very niche very specific and I think that this clothing is a clear representation of it I haven't seen jewelry like this before or a garment like this before right growing up were there any misconceptions about being chin that you face at school or even with friends that you were hanging out with so the framing of that question um kind of is the exact opposite of what i'm thinking because growing up there was not absolutely no misconception because they didn't even know what my ethnicity was or my culture was right. you know in elementary school people would be like they would they wouldn't know what to kind of associate with me me with because they couldn't really figure out my race <laughs> i know that's like a little confusing even now i like get asked if i was like filipino or chinese or even hispanic and which is like crazy to think about but um but there was no misconception because people did not know where i was from and not that that was bad you know it's just 
it's just so like small it's just relatively small and unique to that like country that there's possibly no way they would know so yeah to answer that there was pretty much no misconception so how do you approach those situations when people are trying to guess what where you're from what ethnicity you are um it is I just (laughs) it is a little difficult for sure Uh, I definitely don't want to give them like a whole entire history rundown (laughs) and even me having to go on a podcast to explain where I'm from and everything Mm -hmm. Um, it's not to call out those people at all it's just to kind of uh, for me to you know keep in check with everything that's been asked in my life leading up to this point to kind of um, express that this is my culture this is how I've been raised and that other kids maybe who are in the same position um, as me, they can kind of feel a little bit more comfortable knowing that you don't have to assimilate to one culture or completely, you know, assimilate yourself or completely stick to the one you already have. There's no, you can have the best of both worlds and I think that's what's important. So it's more show and tell than acceptance, right, on your side? I, I would say so because there wasn't a, I didn't feel necessarily, it's a strong word, but I never felt oppressed or I never felt like bullied or judged or anything because, you mm-hmm. know, people just wouldn't have any clue. But um, I would say to those kids who are immigrating here from from um, from Burma or Myanmar, I would tell them that it's okay to not be able to fully assimilate to um, to the American lifestyle. How does speaking the Chin language affect your views on your identity and your daily life and everything else in law? Um, I think language is such an integral part of um, a culture. Uh, even now, just speaking, even if you just speak one language like English, you have to have some sort of, you know, enclave of language within English. You know, if you're a teenager, you probably know slang, you know, you probably don't speak the same way you would as with an adult. So. Um, but for me, personally, uh, relating to my culture, I felt that because I was uh, raised in the United States, I never really had uh, a true experience of some of the people I, uh, I interact with at church because they speak very fluently. They, they um, are very much comfortable in showing themselves at church, but because I was never introduced to that as an early age and never grew up into that uh, system, then it's hard for me to connect with those same people at church because, you know, we don't, I'm, my vocabulary is not as, um, as detailed as theirs or I wouldn't know what they're talking about. The jokes, the phrasing, it just, it doesn't work out because there's a, it's not that I can't get by, I can speak it, I can, you know, interact with um, whoever I want to. It's just, uh, it doesn't feel like it's a full experience, you know, growing up in the United States. Are there any chin phrases or mottos that you've kind of held on to throughout your life or maybe within your culture? Um, I feel like that question is very profound, but honestly, what makes me kind of laugh is um, because there, there's beginning to be more and more immigration from, the, from, from Myanmar to the United States, um, you know, our churches actually try to, like, establish these little, like, summer programs to help us, you know, get, stay in touch with our language, because growing up in the U.S., it, like, completely, you have to completely assimilate yourself, you know, you have a new school system, you have um, new people, you have new neighbors, new way of living, everything, everything is different, so to kind of, so what churches have been doing in our culture is they kind of introduce these like language programs to help us not forget it. They mm-hmm. teach us like the very basic ABCs. Again, even if we already know, fully, we're fully aware of how to speak it. They, there's this one phrase that they would always reiterate to us every summer. It was, it's called Lai Hot and Hot, and that means speak in Chin, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, and there, it's, it, it sounds um, very, it's very, like blunt but it has so much meaning to me looking back because if I hadn't gone to those programs if I hadn't you know made an effort to stay in touch with my uh with my culture then I would wouldn't even know what that phrase meant and it's it's just funny because just those four um words just those four words (laughs) is like plastered 
on posters they they you know they advertise it they put it on our flag and they, there's even a poster hanging above my kitchen table at home really? <laughs> just to remind me because <laughs> my parents think we speak english like way too much growing up so those those little things like that just help me like you know remember to not completely let go of who i am and if you could go back in time and tell that younger self that was uh visit like plastering those four words in her head every night uh what would you say uh i would tell her <laughs> to just embrace being uh being chin i would because once you're in the U america you uh I, I guess i would say i was lucky enough to have the best of both worlds i did s still have that very strong um establishment of church to stay connected to but if for someone that didn't have that same advantage as me, I would tell them that um, just to be active in trying to remember it because, you know, 10 to 50 years from now, it's a really long, that's a really broad spectrum. But just just from that, um, there's really no telling in how our culture, our culture will look like, you know, the even the adults now who don't who know little to know English who don't who aren't raised in America they you know they did so much to get us or their children here so there's so much emphasis on passing on the culture passing on the language you know maintaining close relationships with each other that um, that needs to be acknowledged like it just has to be acknowledged especially in your in an entirely new environment because that's what humans tend to do. They tend to adapt entirely to their environment. And while that's completely normal, it's also it's important to remember where you came from. So that's what I would have to say, just to embrace being Chin and not not shy away from it and not, you know, give up when people or get frustrated when people don't know you or, you know, feel kind of trapped when you don't feel uh, as close as others. Looking to the future, do you think that your chin culture will continue to play a part in your life? Um, for sure. I mean, I think that by taking this step and even talking to you, to y'all in the podcast, though it is not known who even sees this podcast or how many people see it, uh, I think that it's important that even one person like me, who is not even fully, um, I would say a full chin person because <laughs> I wasn't born and raised there but mm -hmm. even someone like me had has the power right now to talk about where they're from um, without having any like consequence or anything like that so I think that it will it will definitely play into the conversation and I, I hope that by you know doing this I'm leading that conversation in, in a way because a lot of kids don't really acknowledge it they just kind of live through life like okay this is our culture this every week we go here we go there we go there but um, I think it's important to just take a step back and then look at where you came from recognize that people are interested in you and then use that to your advantage you know um, not in a malicious <laughs> way but I don't even know how that would be malicious but just use that in a positive no take your experiences and then make it positive and make it lasting to where other people can, you know, learn from it. We'd like to thank you, Christine, for being such a great executive news editor this year. <laughs> thank you. And we look forward Aww. to seeing all the great things oh, you all Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, that was a really nice surprise. I did not know y'all were going to do that. Special thanks to our guest, Christine. Look forward to her upcoming article all about her experiences with Chen Culture releasing soon. Thank you all for joining us in the 14th episode of the Penny Podcast. All links to the content talked about are provided below. Make sure to join us next Thursday for another installment of the Penny Podcast. Yay! <laughs>